say to everybody who wants to break and enter, this is definitely the good place to do it. Uh, well, I mean, try not to break too much. We need it to run. That would be great. Uh, our next speaker is all ready to go. This is Nick Delusky. He is the managing consultant and penetration tester with Spirant. And uh, more importantly, he got approved because this talk just sounded way too much fun. Uh, who here knew about the uh, Simply Safe uh, SDR hacks last year ish? Yeah, well, he's apparently got the whole thing just worked out in the funniest possible way. So, fail safe, yet another Simply Safe attack vector because apparently it wasn't bad enough. So, please welcome Nick. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? Um, I'd like to just start off with a uh, thank you to the Wireless Village for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I have to say I'm a bit humbled to uh, be right in between two individuals who design software defined radios for a living. Um, so this talk uh, sort of takes a different tack toward the Simply Safe um, vulnerabilities that were discovered before. Uh, we'll get to a little bit of the history in a little bit. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Nick Delesky. You know, for the last name, uh, there's only one letter that you don't pronounce, which is not bad for a Polish name. Um, uh, as I uh, said, I'm managing consultant uh, for Aspirant Security Labs. Um, my specialization is actually in, in network pen testing. And uh, I wanted to sort of do this talk to document a little bit about um, how uh, I went about you know, trying to broaden uh, horizons a little bit and, and go beyond uh, just the network pen test, but also taking a look at the general methodology I used and, and sort of how uh, I applied that same methodology to learning some new skills. Um, I have five plus years of pen testing experience. Uh, prior to that, I have uh, a little over six years of uh, security analysis and uh, systems admin experience. So, with that being said, um, there's, uh, you know, obviously the obligatory meme slide here. Um, you know, everybody at home who asks what I do, you know, my friends think that I'm, uh, you know, from, from hackers. My family are convinced that I work for three-letter agencies. TV producers have a laughable uh, concept of what network penetration testers do. Uh, just random people on the street think that, uh, uh, you know, absolutely everything uh, that you see uh, on Mr. Robot is real. Um, some days I think that, you know, all I'm doing is collecting shells, uh, but what I actually do is just drink way too much coffee uh, and do my job. So a little bit of fair warning. Uh, in my experience, uh, as you can see, I come from a systems administration background. I was never a developer. Uh, I learned Python. Uh, through my experience with other scripting languages. Uh, I'm not going to be releasing full or, or finalized code today um, for a couple of reasons. Um, I will, however, be hitting the highlights of you know, some of the milestones that uh, I had reached along the way, uh, talking about some of the libraries I used to uh, create the scripts that I used, and uh, talking about the process. Finally. I'm a sysadmin, it's ugly code anyway. I'm sure that if there are developers in the room, you could do it yourself and, and do it uh, in a way cleaner way than I did. So when we're talking about anything uh, you know, that has multiple components that interact with one another, uh, you know, you're still dealing with some form of a network system. So the user still has to interact with the system. Uh, the system components all still have to interact with one, with one another. Now, the way, the mechanisms for this, uh, not necessarily, uh, they don't look anything like what we're necessarily used to in the traditional uh, client-server model with, uh, you know, uh, laptops and enterprise applications. Uh, however, we can still look at them uh, mostly in the same way. Uh, now, when I am trying to reverse engineer a system, I generally uh, start with the techniques that I'm most familiar with, um, and that familiarity means that I know um, you know, what those techniques are good at and also where the blind spots are. And I, I kind of uh, start with the most familiar uh, so that I know that I can get those out of the way early uh, and then I can, uh, you know, use my time wisely and, and learn uh, more skills uh, along the way. Uh, and that's honestly my goal with every project or every 
um, you know, research um, project that I do. Um, so when we are doing reverse engineering, essentially we're, we're performing um, you know, experimentation over and over again. Uh, we're taking stock of, of what we can infer based on what we know, and we're also taking a look at what can we, how can we apply that knowledge to uh, control the system. And once we have a little bit of control, we're gonna uh, go in a constant loop to uh, you know, see what else we can learn with that control and uh, you know, reassess and reevaluate. So there are a lot of different uh, organizations out there that have penetration testing frameworks. Uh, this is one that I kind of go by uh, when I'm dealing with a specific system uh, as I'm trying to develop an attack or an exploit. Uh, I use some different ones when I'm actually um, you know, dealing with uh, full networks and things like that. But in general, uh, you've got four main uh, uh, phases of it. Open source intelligence, passive recon, active testing, and then weaponizing. Um, so for open source intel, uh, we do have a lot of uh, previous research uh, that's already been done on the Simply Safe system. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, I've also got, obviously, F the FCC filings on the device. We've got setup guides, and we've got help forums. Um, for the passive recon, uh, just in general terms, uh, I like to think of passive recon as, as something that I can do that uh, doesn't directly interface or, or interact or change uh, the environment, or is at least not meant to. Um, so uh, you set up the monitor, and then you perform regular non-malicious tasks, just looking at seeing the activity and, and trying to uh, tease out what you can uh, for later analysis. Now, when you're ready for active testing, you're making controlled changes uh, and looking for differences. Uh, you're observing and comparing responses, and then you're sort of building up uh, some automations to uh, further that process. Finally, we're coming to weaponizing, where we're going to collect and synthesize everything that we have done over the past three phases. Then we're going to perform our tests, where we're actually uh, testing out our hypotheses about how the system works. Uh, we're extending those tests based on new information that comes in, and then we are refining our knowledge and filling in the gaps that we have. Uh, finally, we're going to take the uh, tests and, and the, the exploits that we've already mostly written, we're going to automate it to save time, and we're going to optimize it for whatever uh, our attack scenario is. Uh, the final uh, bullet point there, uh, deploy and exploit, you know, we would do that on a real world penetration test uh, because this is more of a lab exercise. It's not so much of a big deal, not so applicable, so i uh, just like to mention it uh, sort of as a reference. So taking a look at the system components uh, of a Simply Safe system, there are uh, three components that I classify as, as uh, user interface components. Uh, that is the base station. So uh, this uh, road cone looking thing up here uh, is a keychain remote. Well, the remnants of it are up here. If anybody wants to see this after the talk, uh, feel free to, to come up. Um, and then you have the sensors that uh, will uh, hopefully send an alarm to uh, the base station for processing. So the previous research on this, uh, first uh, research that I found on it was done by uh, Andrew Zonenberg, uh, I believe it was with uh, IOActive, uh, sent in February 2016 using a uh, replay attack by interfacing the Simply Safe keypad with a microcontroller. Um, so sort of taking the, the Simply Safe hardware just for the, the radio circuits uh, so that there didn't need to be any reverse engineering on that side of things. And the way I understand it, he was using the uh, packets uh, that were coming in from that radio hardware, decoding them, and then uh, replaying and man manipulating as necessary. Uh, a couple of days later, Michael Osman, uh, who I believe is actually speaking uh, after me, uh, and I'd uh, love to, to get his take on, on what was found here. Um, so he exploited the vulnerability by capturing and decoding packets with SDR and Yardstick 1. Uh, that way, you didn't even have to use any Simply Safe uh, hardware at all to perform the attacks. Um, so while that, uh, that, that uh, vulnerability and, and that information was uh, 
as far as I have uh, done in my research, well received in the information security community. Um, you know, if you take a look at some of the, the user forums and some of the other feedback, um, you know, one of the criticisms uh, was that, well, these are, these are people who are clearly experts in the field, they're on the cutting edge. You know, would, would an attacker be able to exploit, you know, these without advanced degrees in electrical engineering? Uh, and, um, you know, just philosophically speaking, I think that uh, um, we as uh, security researchers kind of need to be on the cutting edge and letting manufacturers know, you know, hey, this is a problem, so that way they can design their systems to withstand uh, conditions that, you know, will occur uh, into the future. So um, these days, kids are being taught in grade school basic programming skills, and, and those programming skills are being applied to things like microcontrollers. SDR, I'm seeing pop up in things like youth library programs. People are learning about radio, and you know, it's a great thing. Technology is surrounding us, and it's not going back the other way. Um, but the fact remains is that the, the threat landscape uh, has certainly changed a lot over uh, the last 10 years and will continue to change in the future. So I don't agree with the assessment that, hey, just because it requires uh, advanced knowledge in the field to be able to, turn, uh, to exploit these attacks, uh, it's not really a flaw. I believe it absolutely is a flaw. Uh, it needs to be fixed. But what I'm gonna do in today's talk is demonstrate um, the vulnerability which is inherent to the security architecture without requiring either SDR or hardware modification. Uh, I am gonna take uh, Simply Safe's hardware and basically use it against them. So uh, one of the components of the system that wasn't uh, directly analyzed in the research that I found was the keychain remote. Now, the keychain remote uh, goes beyond what you would see for, for your car or uh, even you know, some other uh, home security systems. Uh, it actually has USB functionality uh, built into it. And what that USB functionality does is it, it basically presents um, a, a virtual CD-ROM drive to the operating system. And then there's an application and user interface on there uh, that allows uh, the user to uh, make changes to the system, and then it's synchronized back to the base station by this USB port up here at the top. So that interface is uh, programmed in, sh in Shockwave flat, um, yeah, uh, Adobe uh, Shockwave. And so I realized that it might have been a little bit faster to say use a, a Flash decompiler, uh, go that route, but again, not really a developer, sysadmin, uh, going from things that uh, are quick and easy, uh, working my way down to things that I need to, to maybe uh, do a little bit more work on. So, um, like you would expect with the keychain remote, it does have the, the arm and disarm functionality. So, there, there are a couple of risks when taking a look at this, this little piece of hardware right here. Um, first thing that came to my mind is loss or theft. So what happens if somebody gets a hold of this? You know, it's got a full copy of uh, the system's configuration on it. So when I went through, and he, this is just a little quick screenshot of the, uh, the interface here. When I went through some of my open source recon, uh, I saw some uh, guidance originally that said, oh, well, um, you know, I lost my keychain remote. And so what do I need to do to make sure I'm still secure? So originally the uh, guidance was all you have to do is um, just remove the remote from your system. Nobody will be able to arm or disarm your system. It'll be okay. Just we'll send you a replacement. It's all good. But you know that configuration being on the remote really, really didn't sit well with me. So uh, I continued to extend and, and uh, take a look at that component specifically. So I went out and I bought a Simply Safe system. I bought uh, one of the basic packages. It comes with base station, keychain, remote, keypad, uh, four entry sensors, and a motion sensor. 
So uh, it's a good cross-section of uh, sensors. It's a, a reasonable system that you'd expect people to be able to deploy in a small office, home office environment, or in a uh, you know, normal residential environment. Doing my open source recon, uh, I did note some interesting uh, things about the FCC filings themselves. Namely that uh, many of the FCC filings go all the way back to November of 2008. So as I said, the threat landscape has changed significantly in the past 10 years, as you would expect it to. Um, in, uh, in the defense of, of Simply Safe, you know, this, this hardware is um, quite, uh, quite a few years old. Um, you know, I think that the industry as a whole has uh, done a lot of learning since then. So um, kind of following on uh, from that a little bit, you know, I didn't really get too far into in depth with uh, the internal photos and looking at the, the hardware chips and um, you know, looking up individual chips on the devices because again, uh, not really my goal. Uh, I wanted to see what we could do with the hardware, the system as it was on modified. So taking a look at tools that I would use to analyze any USB device, I kind of did a little bit of brainstorming here. We've got uh, Procmon, which is a uh, former sysinternals tool before Microsoft bought sysinternals, um, used useful for um, all kinds of operating system level uh, monitoring of inputs and outputs on the system. Uh, Wireshark has uh, functionality through USB Mon, um, so that would let me see the traffic uh, going from um, the web application interface back down to the physical device itself. Uh, Python, uh, also uh, always a pen tester's friend, uh, has a library Pi USB, which uh, appears to be a, a C types wrapper for uh, lib USB. Uh, also, you can't forget, uh, and I, I do have to credit Google and Stack Exchange for uh, you know, all of the uh, research that I did on there as I was trying to learn a little bit more about uh, USB at a low level and how to uh, interact with it with uh, Pi USB. Um, I'd like to say that you can use your OS of choice here. Uh, just because I chose to uh, do this research and development on a Linux box doesn't mean you couldn't use a Windows box, doesn't mean you couldn't use a uh, uh, Mac OS device. Uh, the USB keychain remote itself doesn't actually support Mac OS, um, so I think that uh, uh, Windows was the, the most convenient for that part of it. Uh, and so I kind of uh, went a hybrid route between Windows and, and Linux for it. Uh, eBay, uh, again, will become uh, um, useful uh, for reasons apparent later on in the talk. And of course, uh, a little bit of caffeine on a cold, snowy afternoon. So taking a look with Procmon, which uh, I would figure would be the uh, best place to look for file activity uh, related to configuration changes, um, you know, actually uh, showed lots of activity, but it didn't show any writes at all. Um, it's not that surprising since there was a uh, CD drive that was uh, being presented by the uh, USB remote as you uh, plug it into the system. So in that regard, that was a good way to confirm kind of what we're looking for, but um, you know, not really uh, useful to us uh, for furthering our access. After that, what I decided to do is I decided to take a quick uh, image of the drive as it was presented to the operating system using DCF-LDD. Uh, DCF-LDD is basically a um, uh, forensic version of, of the basic DD imaging utility. Um, so I took it before uh, image and then I made uh, a couple of changes in the configuration. I took an after image and then I diffed those images. Uh, did not find any changes at all on them. So, okay, pretty confident nothing is happening with that presented CD drive. So after that, I go on to Wireshark uh, and USB Mon. So this is what a typical read uh, access would look like. And again, I apologize if uh, the uh, text is a little bit small. Um, what it shows is a SCSI read with a, an opcode uh, in the parentheses there uh, of 10. So again, it's well understood, understood by Wireshark. It's easily parsed, um, not likely to be anything uh, too far out of the ordinary. What I also found, though, as I was taking a look at the traffic, uh, was that uh, there were some other opcodes that Wireshark couldn't decode. And uh, the one interesting one uh, that 
I really keyed in on was uh, the opcode F6. So as I was taking a look at these uh, F6 opcodes, uh, I did see that the uh, packet lengths were changing a little bit. So going through and doing a little bit more um, analysis, here's another F6 uh, opcode where a couple of packets down, you see the URB bulk in, uh, the length was 576 on that as opposed to the previous one where the length stayed within the, the double digits. Taking a look at that bigger packet, I start to see some uh, interesting information. Uh, namely, what I see is I see the uh, ASCII serial numbers of some of the devices that are in my system. So, uh, what I have is I have the whole configuration in that little 576 uh, byte packet uh, retrieved and saved in plain text. Uh, as I was taking a look at the packet, um, you could see that uh, no authentication methods uh, were used between the host computer and the keychain, uh, and the authentication that uh, occurs between the user and the keychain, uh, where you would ordinarily have to put in your, your master pin that you had previously defined, uh, is easily bypassable because in order to check to see if the, pass if the pin you put in is correct, the application which is running on the laptop needs a copy of the full configuration. So the authentication there certainly set, uh, has some problems. So interestingly, I noted that all of the disarm codes for the system were in plain text. And even better than in plain text, um, they treated the, hex, uh, the hexadecimal uh, nibbles as though they were a full character. So if you took a look at the hex of the packet, um, you know, a disarm code of 9999 would actually show up as 9999. It wasn't even encoded as an integer where you had to do some decoding or, or it wasn't, uh, you know, base 64 or anything like that. So it couldn't get any easier to see the codes. Um, I obtained the serial numbers of all devices on the system except for the base station. And that's uh, significant, uh, significant for a couple of reasons that I'll get into a little bit later. So the Next step is going gonna, is gonna to be to break down the unknown parts of the configuration. My goal here is to identify as much as I can about the device types, the different modes and, and uh, options for those devices, and also the global settings. Uh, another key observation is that the configuration is always a constant size. No matter uh, how long the uh, strings are for, that, that you put into the UI for the um, uh, serial numbers as you're adding new sensors, uh, the configuration is always a uh, constant 512 bytes. And that makes diffing a lot easier for us. Uh, we know that we're going one-to-one. Uh, -one. We don't have to account for uh, changes in address space. If I make a change, it's going to change a finite number of bytes in the configuration. And so I can tell exactly which bytes were affected immediately. It also brings up the prospect of possible buffer overflow in other parts of the system, although that wasn't really what I wanted to go for today, so I didn't test for it, maybe another day. So this is where we start our analysis and our, our making our control changes. Go through and we make our tr control changes in the UI, we compare our data uh, to what we previously saw, and then we just wash, rinse, repeat as much as, as, much as we can, as fast as we can. So, in order to automate that process a little bit, because you know, even in a small system like this, there are quite a bit of uh, quite a few variables in terms of the sensors and the actual uh, global settings themselves. Um, you know, I turned to Pi USB, uh, Python again uh, being a fairly robust language. There's usually libraries out there to do um, the bulk of what you want to do. Um, so I wrote a little script to go through and. Uh, get all the information that Pi USB can off of a device. Um, so the device itself is, is fairly basic. And in order to, to uh, start off, you need to know which device you're actually going to query. Uh, simplest way to do that on a Unix command line, um, you know, you're going to do an ls of the USB. I just happen to redirect that into a file called USB1. You plug in the physical keychain remote. Um, pipe that output to USB 2, and then a simple diff USB 1, USB 2, 
leaves me with uh, the string right there. So this is uh, just a quick Pi USB script that'll go through. It will uh, detect if there is a Simply Safe Keychain remote that is uh, attached to the system, and it's going to print everything that it knows about that device. If it doesn't find the device, it'll print a little sad face. So, all right, we know that we can interface with the device uh, as it is on, on uh, you know, the typical uh, Unix Linux machine. Um, as noted before in one of the previous slides, uh, it's a simple device that only has one configuration. Uh, and when you're talking USB, uh, you kind of have a, a, a hierarchy where at the top level you have the device, down below that you have the device configuration, below that you have interfaces, and on an interface you could have uh, a couple of different endpoints. So there's only one configuration, uh, there's one interface, and I believe two different endpoints. Uh, couldn't get much simpler than that. Um, interestingly enough, if you just start querying some of the other devices that are on your, uh, that are on your system uh, or any other random USB gadget you have, uh, you, know, it's, you can find some pretty interesting stuff out about uh, you know, your, your hardware you just have sitting around with very little effort. So here's how we start out. Uh, we actually use Pi USB to um, connect to the endpoints on the USB drive. So EPO is the uh, output endpoint. So that Lambda function there will basically just uh, help uh, Pi USB go through and query for the first one available. Um, I believe that you can actually hard code those uh, endpoint uh, uh, numbers as well. Uh, I just happen to use this. And again, this is uh, code that was uh, borrowed from Stack Exchange. So uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, so this one here contains really what's uh, important for uh, the analysis that we're going to be doing. Um, for uh, the sake of speed and for the sake of, uh, of being easy, uh, I decided to go the replay attack route instead of trying to go through and uh, decode those, those custom op codes. Uh, I didn't want to risk bricking the device uh, because that would get expensive eventually. Uh, and also, you know, if you know something works, when you're early in the analysis period, get what you need to out of it first, and then maybe you can uh, afford to be a little bit more exotic with your attacks. So I did take uh, the uh, bytes from uh, the commands to get the configuration from the USB remote. I also took the uh, bytes from the request to set the data, write it back to the remote. Uh, and also, there appears to be a reset packet uh, that uh, gets sent in order to make sure that um, you know multiple writes and multiple reads are, are, are handled by that interface application. Um, so I also captured those bytes as well. Um, never did get the reset packet to work, which is part of the reason why I'm not releasing any code. Um, so one of those things that uh, I can work on another day. So you put the the blob into the uh, replay and. Uh, you set with the epo.write uh, routine there, uh, send the request to get the data, then you have to read the data in from the buffer. Um, what I found is that uh, the timings were sometimes a little bit inconsistent when I was trying to access it through Pi USB. So I did write a, a little uh, uh, try block there, which uh, will somewhat handle the, uh, the timeout operations. And what you get back is you get that back the raw config data as a Python list. Um, so now we're just going through and we're mapping GUI elements to configuration addresses. Uh, for the globals, what I found is that they put the global configs um, in the first part of uh, the packet. And then you've got the pins, um, which, by the way, again, all the pins plus the, the duress pin as well. Uh, if somebody were looking to play a, uh, a really cruel joke, um, you know, they could switch the duress pin with uh, the uh, master pin and bad things would happen. Uh, again, that's uh, something that, that really emphasizes the need to lock down all these dis different interfaces. Um, you know, it's not just a, a trivial, uh, trivial thing and actually sort of you kind of wonder why the functionality was built into the remote in the first place 
given that somebody's going to carry this around everywhere, it could, you could easily lose it. Uh, personally, I think that this information would have been better handled by uh, providing an application that uh, generates the configuration, puts it on a USB stick, and that way, you know, you know that configuration is on that USB stick. You can lock it away. You can keep it wherever you want. You don't need to carry it around all the time in order to use why the device was, uh, was built, which is as a remote control. So after going through all of the uh, different uh, configuration settings in the, the GUI, which include things like uh, alarm volume, uh, whether or not there are any uh, lights that are activated uh, at any point, uh, the alarm uh, signal duration, so that's the amount of time that you have to get to the keypad and put in the pin before the alarm goes off. Um, it also includes uh, things like whether the voice chime is on, whether the, the chime functionality is on, which dings when uh, you know, a, a sensor is activated. So all that stuff is now mapped out. Uh, in addition, the different sensors have uh, an option block, uh, which do different things depending on the sensor as well. Um, so for uh, an entry sensor, uh, you could have a configuration where uh, the sensor is only active uh, when the uh, alarm is armed in away mode, which uh, for those not familiar with home alarm systems, generally they can be armed in home away or home uh, at home. That way you're not... Um, uh, you're, you're disabling certain sen sensors while you're still in your house, so that way you're not tripping your, your system every time you want to go down to the basement or every time you know, your dog runs by the, the motion sensor. So uh, a little while later, after I uh, go through with uh, you know, some automation, some scripting to identify the addresses, what goes where, we have a little bit of a better idea of uh, what serial numbers are matched to which device. Uh, I spat out the data as a, some ASCII config, uh, just kind of for reference and, and to uh, you know, give a little bit of uh, scale on how big that, uh, that configuration actually is. Uh, as you can see, I was able to easily parse out the volume, um, whether the door chime was active, uh, and you know, all the different pins broken out by uh, number and, and function. So now that we have a significant amount of information about how the system actually works, uh, we're gonna ask ourselves, what in total do we know about the system at this point? So we know that adding sensors to the system only requires a serial number based on what we've seen from uh, the GUI. Uh, in addition, we know that communications are susceptible to replay attacks from the previous work that was done by um, uh, Andrew uh, Zonenberg and Michael Osman. So what's our hypothesis here? Uh, so sensor doesn't likely authenticate the base station because it's just broadcasting simple packets uh, out to anybody who will listen. So the sensor types and numbers are contained in the configuration data, and a sensor is configurable in a, spe in a separate base station. Um, uh, the hypothesis here, rather, is that the sensor can be configured in a separate base station based on a config that's stolen from uh, a USB stick. Also, it's noted in the documentation that the sensor range is about 100 feet uh, from the base station, and given that sensors are often placed on the perimeter of a protected area, on the windows, the doors, um, it's pretty likely that there's going to be overpenetration out to public areas or areas that you're not really able to physically control so much. So taking uh, our, our uh, three sub-hypotheses, um, the hypothetical attack that we're going to work on is uh, that a stock base station can be configured with sensor values from a stolen configuration, um, and then an arbitrary malicious base station can receive and interpret those sensor signals. What's the next step? It's going to be to source another base station and test out our hypothesis. So for that, uh, I turned to eBay. I didn't feel like dropping another uh, couple hundred dollars on another full system from retail. Uh, I found that you were actually, I was actually able to obtain uh, a separate base station uh, with keychain remote from eBay for about 70 bucks, I think. So forgive the electrical tape here. This is so I don't actually confuse which one was the victim and which one was the, the malicious base station. So once I obtained that second system, I was able to configure both systems so that uh, alternately so that uh, they would uh, chime when one of the entry sensors was tripped. Uh, I started off with 
Um, the sensor configured just in one, not the other. Uh, set the chime, confirmed, yeah, I heard the tone. Then I uh, configured it in both, uh, and I set off the sensor uh, and conf confirmed that I heard the chime out of both base stations. So yes, that confirms our hypothesis. The sensors are just doing a very basic broadcast out, uh, and any base station uh, in the area can listen to that uh, sensor and interpret it and integrate it into its own operations. So now we're going to take that hypothesis, we're going to extend it, and we're going to refine it even more. So what else do we know about the system? We know that the base station uh, can be configured to read data from arbitrary sensors now that we've done that test. We also know from uh, the documentation that online monitoring is an optional add-on. So what we're going to do now is we're going to test to see if a physically planted device uh, has usable remote connectivity uh, to pretty much anywhere in the world via the base station's built-in 2G connection. Uh, we also know that uh, the system will send monitoring alerts, and so we should be able to build up a pretty robust picture of how that system is used uh, over time. So being a pen tester, this is something that we do uh, when, there, uh, when there is a physical aspect to our engagements. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of uh, how I would go through and uh, you know what I'd be looking for are trends in terms of building usage and, and things of those nature and things of that nature. But um, you know if someone were, were so inclined or uh, if this were a penetration test engagement, you know we absolutely could do a lot of uh, analysis and, and trending and, and things like that um, to determine when, for example, uh, the house or the protected area would be most likely unoccupied or, or other attack scenarios. So our next step is to provision online monitoring for the malicious base station uh, to receive these uh, alerts when the sensors are triggered. So I set up, I, I had access to a, uh, a friendly uh, multi-tenant multi -tenant office, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an office in a uh, multi-tenant office building. So I was able to set up uh, the original retail bought Simply Safe system as it would be deployed in a normal uh, small office sort of environment. As I, I did that, I also put the malicious base station uh, down in my vehicle in the parking lot. And what I found was that uh, I was able to receive alerts that were delivered to me by email uh, about the comings and goings in that office even though the base station itself was on uh, a different physical level, it was on, the, it was on a, a parking lot that was uh, outside of the building, it wasn't even right next to the, the actual office. Uh, so it was a significant uh, distance away. I didn't get all of the sensors, which one would expect. Uh, one would hope that uh, you know, the sensor wouldn't penetrate all the way out that way, but uh, certainly enough to uh, give me an idea of when the office was uh, occupied. So now that we know that we have a hypothetical attack that works, what are we going to do to uh, automate that, that attack and really make it uh, usable in a real world scenario? So one thing you can do to automate the attack uh, is to run uh, the data capture script as a service in the background on your machine. So that way, really, the only uh, limiting factor in the time it takes to do the attack is the time to undo the cap on the remote and plug it into a US USB port. Mere seconds. You can either save that configuration off to a file. Uh, you can uh, Bluetooth it off to another location. Um, you know, any means of exfiltration at that point is, uh, is completely valid. And, and what else can we do to optimize it for a particular attack scenario? So, when you are thinking about these, these uh, USB keys, there are a couple of different scenarios that uh, pop to mind. Um, lost and stolen is obviously one aspect of it, but uh, it doesn't even necessarily have to be fully lost. Uh, I was uh, going for, for a run at the gym one day, and I just happened to see one of these sitting on the little key hanger things that are, are outside the front of the, the building. Um, why someone would, would 
put their keys on one of those in the first place. Being a security professional, again, is, is, is beyond me, but there are people that do it. Uh, and so it got me thinking, you know, well, people do actually give their keys to people for short periods of time, whether it's a valet or uh, a mechanic or, again, on one of those little boards. Um, a lot of times people will leave their keys in the break room at work. Um, and they might not even necessarily know that somebody was able to pick up their keys. Um, I, I know a number of years ago there was, uh, I guess, an, an interesting uh, talk about somebody who managed to replicate a uh, physical key with a 3D printer uh, just by taking a picture of it. So this would kind of be the equivalent of that. Um, you, know, you can actually run the script easily, very, very easily, on uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, and again, for those that might not be familiar with the Pi Zero, it is um, a very, very small board, which is actually uh, about the same size as the keychain itself. Uh, you can wire that up to uh, you know, a, a very inexpensive USB power supply. Um, you, know, you can oftentimes get them as uh, swag at uh, you know, conventions, or uh, you know, they're given out uh, for free just for promotional material. So you know, for the cost of five bucks for a Pi Zero, uh, you know, an extra flash card you have sitting around, USB OTG cable. Uh, you know, you can have an easily concealable uh, method of actually collecting this data. So I did actually reach out to Simply Safe uh, when I found, that, found this vulnerability uh, to do some coordinated disclosure. So uh, they had actually uh, been, in con been in contact with me for a couple of months uh, and they had released a security advisory today. Um, it's available as a blog post uh, up on Simply Safe's website there. Uh, just provided for anybody who wants to check that out. Now, obviously, you know, I think that uh, you know, their recommendations uh, you know, and, and my recommendations can disagree a little bit. Reasonable minds can disagree. Um, so I'm told that there's actually going to be a utility that they came out with that's going to help mitigate this problem as well. Uh, where customers can actually wipe the configuration off of their keychain remote while they're not making changes. So it would work like this. Basically, you would make change. You would want to make changes to your system. You would take your keychain remote. You'd plug it into the base station. It would write the configuration data to the keychain. You'd plug it into the system, uh, to the laptop, make your changes, uh, and then you'd resync it to the base station. And then you'd run this utility on the laptop again that would reset the, the data, wipe it off the keychain. Um, you know, absolutely, uh, for having hardware that was uh, first envisioned and deployed almost 10 years ago, um, I think that that's a, a, a novel way of uh, mitigating the risk. Personally, um, I think that a lot of users uh, might not want to go through that trouble. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of users might forget to do that. Um, I think that uh, having something out there uh, and acknowledging that, hey, yeah, there is a configuration on here and you do need to uh, take into consideration more than just your, your base station uh, is, a, is a good step. Uh, Simply Safe also did uh, modify some of their, their guidance to say, hey, if you lose a remote, you, know, you should reset your pins just in case. Um, I recommend uh, not using the USB enabled remote just in case you forget to wipe it. Uh, also, I would recommend um, uh, if uh, the USB enabled uh, remote is lost, you know, obviously you can uh, change the pins immediately, uh, but really there's no known remedy to reinitialize the compromised sensor serial numbers. So that kind of makes you uh, think about whether or not um, you know, the, the, you have to think about your own risk profile, basically. A small business uh, is, is going to be a different risk profile to somebody who's using this to protect their home. Um, so it might be a good idea to supplement uh, additional security measures, uh, things like uh, uh, web cameras that util utilize different technologies, say Wi-Fi or, or wired connections, uh, or uh, additional locks that might also have uh, notification uh, capabilities as well. So uh, again, you know, yeah, we're pointing out a vulnerability. Uh, it's going to be up to the ind individual to determine whether or not 
uh, this vulnerability really affects their use case. Uh, finally, I'd just like to mention uh, it's a good idea always to restrict physical access to the base station. Um, it's one of the things where, um, you know, if you do a little bit of Googling about Simply Safe, uh, there are some uh, other YouTube attacks out, uh, attacks out there that you can find on YouTube. I haven't tested them myself. I'm not going to vouch for whether or not they actually are real. Uh, but just to be on the safe side, uh, it is uh, a good idea to just sort of keep this um, in a physically safe spot uh, if you can, uh, if you're going to continue to use the system. So what I've found about the system is that uh, the vulnerabilities that um, are inherent to the architecture of the system are exploitable in three different ways. Uh, you can use hardware hacking, you can use SDR and signals analysis, or you can use the native device and abuse of the features that are already built into the system. Uh, when you have a secure product and when uh, you are going through and you're inspecting uh, your designs, you're doing risk analysis, it doesn't really matter what the tools are used to attack it. it it's a strong architecture. Um, saying that, you know, well, it's not really a valid attack because they, they used one skill or they used one uh, particular tool uh, becomes an irrelevant point because you're actually getting to the meat of the problem. You're fixing the root cause. So is the system still useful uh, and effective? A and as I said before, that really depends on the individual. So an individual who uh, you know, is looking at high risk human threat actors, so somebody that um, has a reason to have a, a, a home security system, um, and it's an unfortunate reality that, that people out there uh, you know, have stalkers, they have PFAs against people, uh, they know that there are threats that have been made, uh, things of that nature. Um, I'm not sure that I would recommend uh, this system to somebody who knows that there is a uh, uh, high risk of, of something happening, uh, needing to alert the police quickly. Uh, low and medium risk uh, human threat actors, uh, I'd say that depends on uh, you know, more the use case of you know, are you looking to protect property? Are you looking to supplement additional controls? Uh, it might still be effective on uh, defending against uh, normal smash and grab type uh, burglaries. Uh, it might be uh, still useful in um, deterring um, uh, there being a, an incident in the first place. Uh, however, it's kind of hard to measure a negative. How do you, how do you measure something that doesn't happen? Um, and then there also is the environmental monitoring piece, the environmental threat actors. There's no intelligence, there's no active circumvention of, of carbon monoxide de uh, detector, um, you know, smoke detectors uh, and, and water detectors. Um, that's not really my area of expertise. I would leave it to somebody like Underwriters Labs to test those components. Um, you know, they know really uh, what's what, what the key variables are and making sure that those, uh, those systems are effective. Um, so on a high level, what I would say the, the uh, most apparent vulnerability in the architecture itself is a lack of uh, two-way authentication. Um, so when you have a sensor that is broadcasting out to anybody who will listen uh, and you have a system that will uh, accept that data uh, without uh, proving integrity or, or identity, um, you know, that's really a system that, that's not able to uh, do uh, some very key things from an information security perspective. Uh, you don't have confidentiality, you don't have a data integrity, uh, and you don't have data authenticity. Um, when you're uh, building an, uh, a system like this, you would expect it to have some confidentiality, you'd expect it to have integrity checks, you'd expect it to have auth uh, authentication checks. Um, so two-way authentication, I think, would uh, be uh, the goal for, for manufacturers of alarm systems, making sure that you can't just do simple replay, uh, replays, simple spoofs, uh, things of that nature to, to get around and, and cause problems, uh, whether it be false positives or uh, false negatives. Does anybody have any questions? All right, well, thank you very much for uh, coming to the talk today. Uh, if you're uh, interested in, in reaching out, there's a couple of different ways you can get a hold of me. Uh, I am on LinkedIn. I'm not on Twitter, uh, although uh, my company is. So you can go to uh, the Twitter handle, at Spirant Security. Um, you can reach out to me directly uh, 
we're at nick.dolesky at spirant.com. Uh, you can reach out to the whole group at uh, security labs at spirant.com. Um, and for anything that's more, you know, of a, of a uh, enthousia enthusiast or, or other sort of email, you can reach out to me. Uh, believe it or not, this actually is a valid email address down there. So did I see a hand over here? And by the way, we do have a couple of shirts, so if you have some questions, uh, feel free to, to come up and grab a shirt too. I don't uh, did you find any attributes um, in the configuration that were very specific to that particular setup that you had? Can you uh, speak into the microphone? Yeah, did you find any attributes in your configuration that were specific to that particular setup? So, were unique uh, to that setup? So a lot of the attributes that I found were, were pretty common among the other uh, home security systems I, I've looked at. Um, you know, it, it was a pretty bare bones configuration, um, but it is a, a fairly straightforward um, embedded system. It's not... No, no, I mean, were, they mo were most of the parameters very generic or were they particular to that particular setup to, to recognize each other, the sensor wise? Oh, they they were, they were fairly generic. Um, they were very you know, generic. Everything okay. was, was uh, easily set up with uh, just um, entering the serial number in the config, so you didn't really have to have a whole lot of um, customization. Um, were, you were, were you referring to the testing setup or the actual alarm setup? The actual alarm setup. The actual alarm setup, no. Uh, everything is fairly generic. Oh, yeah? Um, you know, what I would say is that it wouldn't be interoperable with other systems, but it's not really a complex system. Okay, yeah, thank you. Other questions? Uh, so I gave a Torcon talk in 2015 where I used an MC catcher to basically analyze the communication between the base station and the actual like remote monitoring side. Okay. And it just sends unencrypted UDP packets, and then on their back end it's using the base station serial number and the uh, keypad or sensor serial number to actually trigger those alerts. So did you find anything that would let you uh, get the base station serial number from the USB keypad or no. any anything else? No, I, I did not. And uh, I think that that would be uh, a key differentiator. I, I, and uh, again, uh, the base station serial number would have been uh, a completely different story. If you could find that on the on the device, uh, no, it is not on the device configuration. All right, cool. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time. <laughs>